Hi guys and welcome to my channel. My name is David Nates and as you guys can probably tell from other videos on my channel, well, I love movies. So in a previous video I spoke about my top 5 VFX movies that changed the cinema forever in the 20th century. Well for this video I thought it'd be fun to focus on my top 5 films that changed the movie industry in the 2000s. As time goes by, well, cinema techniques and technology progress too. The thing about the late 90s and early 2000s is the fact that computers were getting more and more powerful and affordable. With that, editing programs such as Adobe Premiere or 3D modeling software such as 3D Studio Max were becoming more and more widespread and used, even by the smaller studios. Also, with the advent of the first fully digital cameras and the fact that most movies were getting edited on computers, VFX became a big part of the 2000s. Sometimes I feel like the 80s was a good mix of practical props with matte painting and very simple CGI, whereas the 90s still had those practical VFX going for them. But sometimes because they were still exploring 3D modeling and CGI, it led to some awkward movies. Not to bash on the 1999 Star Wars film The Phantom Menace, but even though the movie wasn't the best, I must give it to George Lucas for having taken the risk of developing a fully digital camera. I'll dare to say that he was ahead of his time and actually paved the way to the cinema of the 21st century. Now with all of that being said, there are a ton of masterpieces that were made in the 2000s and I'd like to share with you my top 5 picks that influenced me as an actor and a filmmaker. The first one I'd like to mention is the 2001 movie directed by Peter Jackson. The Lord of the Rings. As a teenager, I was mesmerized by the writing of J.R.R. Tolkien, and I was overjoyed when they announced that the books would be adapted into a series of movies. So in order to bring Middle Earth to the big screen, director Peter Jackson collaborated with VFX supervisor Richard Taylor. In those days, one of the reasons that the fantasy genre was not done too much was because it was actually extremely hard to do right. For this trilogy, Richard Taylor and his workers at Weta Workshop played around with a technique called bigatures, which is a term referring to miniature models, but because of their size and detail were coined as big and not just miniatures. Early on in pre-production, director Peter Jackson had decided to create small sized models of structures to the last detail and then add some digital work instead of creating these locations fully digitally. For the movie, Weta Digital had to create over a thousand houses which ranged from 172 scale to 114 scale. Some of the bigger bigatures were around 7 meters tall. Moreover, in order to make the hobbits and humans look different in height, they often used forced perspective through specific camera moves which created these intricate illusions. Even though a ton of old school VFX techniques were being used in order to make Middle Earth look real, the most notable VFX that they were able to introduce was the character of Gollum as a fully CGI character. Richard Taylor and his crew at Weta Digital had actor Andy Serkis wearing a motion capture suit on his body as well as motion detectors over his face in order to capture all of his expressions. In today's movies, capturing someone's expressions through motion capture techniques may seem normal. But in those days, being able to have the actor performing his scenes and then being able to send the captured data to 3D artists was unheard of. The fact of having such an intricate and pivotal character on screen literally paved the way to current industry standards. The second movie I'd like to mention is a 2008 movie, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, directed by David Fincher, where we follow the life of Benjamin Button, a man who is born old but as time passes by we realize that he is actually aging backwards. The concept in itself is pretty crazy as it kind of shows how everything has an ending and a beginning and how even when we reverse it, the beginning can be the end. After all, we are all born helpless as little babies and sometimes in our old age we become helpless again. It's not always the case as some elderly people do extremely well, but it still amazes me at how much two extremes can be so similar. For this movie they had to create a young old man and because of that and the somewhat imaginary portrayal of that character, the first 52 minutes of the movie have the head of Brad Pitt's character as a CGI creation. In order to create these VFX, Mr. Fincher teamed up with visual effects supervisor Eric Barba in order to create a process dubbed Emotion Capture. For that they tried to use an existing technique called the MOVA system which is designed to capture 24 frames per second data that can be used to identically recreate the performance on a CGI version of the same character. 
The limitation with that existing system was the fact that the actor needed to remain seated and didn't allow for much movement. Since Benjamin Button was supposed to be moving and interacting with other characters, they had to create a rig called the Mova Contour, which is designed to hold 28 cameras in an array around the actor, mounting them on a speed rail like structure that surrounds about 150 degrees of the actor. This allowed for frame by frame tracking patterns of the face in the 3D space. This was actually the first system to capture someone's face in real time. At least for me this movie is a masterpiece because even though it has an enormous amount of VFX, it actually doesn't feel like a VFX movie. This is kind of like the curse of great special effects. Sometimes they're so well done that you forget that they're even there and are simply transposed into the movie world. The third movie I'd like to mention is the 2005 film Sin City created by Frank Miller and directed by Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller. This for me was the first time that I actually saw a graphic novel literally coming to life. It was as if the pages of the comic strip were being projected onto the cinema screen. This movie was shot entirely on a green screen and in the compounds of the Troublemaker Studios in Austin, Texas. The critical point of this movie is that Robert Rodriguez wanted the movie to follow the exact style of the graphic novels. The crazy thing about the Sin City graphic novels is that the drawings are in black and white with no grayscale at all. When drawing something, the artist can put highlights here and there on the drawings, but recreating that in real life is pretty much impossible. The groundbreaking thing about this whole movie is the fact that in traditional CG, characters are placed over a background, and in this project, it's the other way around. Basically, it's filming real characters on computer graphics. Originally, the movie was supposed to be close to the books with no detail and just black and white. But as production continued and the VFX style evolved, Rodriguez settled on a very stylized look that incorporated black and white, photorealism, and specific objects colored throughout the movie. For the filmmakers, shooting such an ambitious movie without actually knowing the final style must have been a real challenge. The whole film was shot in color initially, as it was just easier for the filmmakers, and little by little in post-production, they were able to peel the colors away one by one. The good thing about filming in color, since some objects were left in color in the final product, was the fact that if you didn't need to add color back in, it was much easier to do so. Even with time, this movie still feels like an extremely rich masterpiece, including a cast of extremely interesting characters and a dark undertone throughout the whole film. I can't imagine someone not at least being intrigued to watch this piece of art. The fourth movie that I'd like to mention is the original Transformers film, which was released in 2007 and directed by Michael Bay. I must admit that as a whole, I'm not a big fan of the Transformers movies and its subsequent franchise. It's, it's really not my cup of tea. But as far as VFX go, I can only remain in awe with what they have managed to achieve. When Industrial Light and Magic was first asked to do VFX for this movie, the crew thought that they'd be modeling three to four heroes that might be doing 14 transformations at most. After one year of production, the team assembled 60,217 vehicle parts and over 12.5 million polygons in 14 automatons that were flipping, flying, driving, and fighting each other while smashing through city buildings and streets. If there's a lack of story in this particular film, VFX made it up in a big way. In order to create specific characters for each robot, they had to reference a ton of archival footage for each character. For example, Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future was the reference for Bumblebee. Liam Neeson was the reference for Optimus Prime as a soft-spoken leader with a big presence. In order to create facial expressions in these robots, a modeling team led by Dave Fogler created various sliding pieces for cheeks and jaws multi-segmented parts for the lips and turbines to simulate the pupils dilating. Just to get a better idea of how intricate these robots were, Optimus Prime had around 200 facial parts that could be moved individually by animators in order to create whatever expression they desired. Also, Michael Bay never wanted the robots to feel stiff. He wanted them to look agile and not limited by their weight. Another problem of animating these huge robots was that in order to create more weight to them, they would need to slow movement down. In order to do that, they had extra frames to reference footage of the stunt actors to slow their movement. Since it's animation, they could stretch some movements and keep some other movements at normal speed. By playing with the timeline, this way they managed to make the animated robots look heavy, yet agile at the same time. The fifth movie that I'd like to mention is none other than James Cameron's 2009 film Avatar. This is the movie that actually broke all boundaries of stereoscopic 3D cinema with its revolutionary production techniques. 
This movie is a game changer in the way VFX movies are made, watched, discussed, and written about. James Cameron, being the perfectionist that he is, created three distinct versions of the film. A 2D version, a digital 3D version, and the IMAX 3D version, assuring that each type of viewing would present an amazing spectacle. What's crazy about Avatar is the virtual cinematography workflow created by Rob Legato, allowing the director to directly observe the CG characters in real time on an LCD monitor. By creating this type of interface, they were able to create and interact with the actors and direct CG scenes as though they were live action. In some ways, this has created a sort of 5D where reality and the digital world have blended into one. This was a total revolution because the interface could speak to him in the moment and actually scenes could be changed on the spot. By doing things this way, it added creativity and a more organic feel to the movie, also eliminating the need of having to do a lot of the tedious pre animation that is usually created for CGI movies. This movie is amazing for its VFX, but the real shining light of the production was the fact that the VFX system built for these movies is a real director-centric breakthrough. Meaning that it was no longer the director saying, give me something like this, but more a regular film experience where the cameraman would pick the camera up and the director could see how the shot would look and the animators would just need to refine it. Obviously, even though the system could show 3D in real time, it didn't mean that it wasn't lower resolution and models with lower polygon counts. Another amazing feat in animation was the FAX or the Facial Animation Codex system developed by Paul Elman. They used this technology in order to cover the dialogue scenes. The thing about lips is that they are extremely hard to track because their shape changes constantly. This system was put in place in order to input training data into it so that the facial editor could learn to interpret what was going on and keep adding to the system. Even with all the technology, editors still had to put their artistic past to make the models and world look even more magnificent. I could literally go on about this movie and all the other movies I spoke about for a very long time. These are just five films that I picked because they stood out in my mind, but the 2000s was packed with amazing movies with each breakthrough Movie making becomes better and techniques get more refined. Looking at movies from the beginning of movie making up to now is, well, it's just amazing. Each decade has its charm and the 2000s will be remembered for a ton of breakthroughs. I really hope that you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed exploring these masterpieces. Please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. I hope that you have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.